is working. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so first of all, just to introduce myself, my background is uh, from large-scale systems integration. I spent 10 years at Capgemini uh, building the concept of things, what is an architect and things like that. And then I spent some time um, as a, operating a, an, an enterprise that spent effort identifying what IT assets there were in an organization. So actually tracking what was there and <coughs> part of that led on to the cloud because it turns out that most companies don't know what they've got in their data centers and, uh, and the rest of the state. So um, this, this is based on my experience in those spaces. It's my perspective on how I think the software engineering world sees uh, our application development is, is, is evolving at the moment in the context of IPv6. Um, I also spent some time building IoT systems. So I designed this system that's now British Gas Hive system. Uh, so I've got quite a bit of experience in, in consumer-based IoT. Um, and IPv6 was one of the things that I, I moved to there quite early, quite early on, um, and it wasn't taken up well. Okay. Um, now, you've seen the earlier graphs of Google's view of the world and how it's uh, adopting IPv6. Um, this is some data that I've split out since 2015 when I was looking at IoT, which shows the per country um, variation in the Google numbers. Now, ignore the big jumps because I think those are largely down to measurement changes uh, rather than anything else. Um, but it is pretty clear when you look at this, there hasn't been a huge uptick. Um, and we know that the average age of an application from the stuff I was looking at where applications in the environment is about seven years. Um, there hasn't been any sudden uptick later on. So it's not, it's not reaching top of mind for those who are defining what applications should do and how they should work within an enterprise. Um, it's just the point on that. Okay. I'll come back to these countries in a few minutes as well. Okay. So this, this is just for those of you who are not familiar with development. This, this is a world-class development approach. And you start at the left with an idea. Uh, you build an executable specification. So those are the tests that you use to confirm that you've built what you think you're going to build. Uh, you don't have a set of documents describing what it's going to do. That's captured in the executable spec. You then start writing the unit tests for the individual components. Then you get on to writing the code. Then you get some, some code which does the build and the deploy and then you run it in the runtime environment. And there are loopbacks on all those layers. Um, just want to make sure you're all familiar with that sort of model. That's the best. Most legacy systems don't have that kind of quality. It's not uncommon to find systems in, in an environment where there is no source code, for instance, uh, which isn't a great situation to be in when you're trying to move things. OK, this, this is the, the bit from the right-hand side of that. Um, and from a development point of view, there are at least four, probably more, different environments that you need to be working with. And the, the key thing is that they need to be the same from the point of view of the software that's been developed. Now, that includes the stuff that sits on the developer's desk um, through to the stuff in production. And if there's any variation in that, particularly in the operational use cases, uh, it means your environment isn't going to work the way you want it to. Now, a key issue about that is that the last time I looked, um, Docker didn't work on an Apple Mac in IPv6. Um, which is a bit bizarre. Since the world is moving towards container-based delivery, you'd think it would have some of that. There actually seems to be some pushback amongst the Docker community for using v6 at all, which, is, which I find very odd. Uh, I had a, a discussion with the Docker Swarm people, and they said, yeah, we've heard of IPv6, but we don't want to use it. And the reason is they're like NAT, unfortunately. And everybody's very familiar with NAT. Um, anyway, I'll come on to that in a second. So you've got to be able to mock out the, the external dependencies as well and make sure that the environment as it's running looks the same um, so you can see what's going on. Okay. And this is the basis of the DevOps model where the developers are responsible for the runtime environment and making sure it's, it's maintained, managing the service levels, making sure they're being met. If you don't combine development and operations, what happens is the developers throw it over the wall, operations implement something that's a bit like the software but not quite the same. They, the operations build a whole set of tools to try to manage it, and it falls over and nobody knows what's going on. It costs a lot of money to get things back. If you make the developers responsible for fixing things or finding what's gone wrong, then things get fixed very quickly. This, this system here is, is, is one from real environment. Uh, it's a, an international money trading environment. Um, and I know that the cycle time from checking in a line of code change, whether that's in the op functional code or the, the, the behavioral code, or the, the stuff for, for changing the deployment, uh, to getting it into production is one and a half hours in that particular case. And that includes all data migration, data testing, scale testing, and everything. Um, 
that's, that's the best, unfortunately. The, the, the worst is not like that. Okay. So to, to come back to the point, IPv6 is not really a burning issue for most enterprises that I see. Um, I've you know, talked to a number of development teams uh, and marketing people about this. And unfortunately, unlike Y2K, there's no burning platform. So it's very hard to build urgency in a business case. I'm seeing some, does anybody agree with us? I think that's a bit odd. Yeah. Tom, you're looking like you're a bit query. You know, go on, ask me. Okay, all right, okay. Um, another comment is that when, IPv, when IP addresses are embedded in an application, it's a bit like the Y2K problem in that it's embedded in the code somewhere and it's not easy to spot where it is. So if you don't have the test situation, trying to pull it out can be very difficult. And it, and it could include the stuff that Veronica was on about in terms of the automation process. You want to put into the automation process knowledge about what a particular IP address represents. Is this a production environment? Is this a development environment? One of the, one of the common problems you get with, with, with automation is that people accidentally deploy the new system to production before they do it to, to, develop, to development, which doesn't work very well. Um, there has been some progress amongst the internet natives, notably Meta. Uh, less so I've seen amongst the cloud developers. And it's good news to hear that AWS and whatever you're starting to come forward. But I'm not convinced that they put it as a first class solution. They still like to give the developers the comfort of knowing that they can use NAT. Um, and the developers naturally go to NAT because if you look at the right hand side there, that's those numbers there for the different countries represent when um, IPv6 would be 75% of the market in those countries. And based on the, 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 fir the first place things. Now, if I'm setting out with a new application, I don't really want to cut out 25% of my market straight away. So, and, and if I'm a developer, I don't really care what happens after 2028 because I've got to move on to do something else. So how do I get it to the top? And I think the only way you can do it is you start to talk to senior management and get them to buy into it. And you need the same sort of approach that, that uh, Zuckerberg took at, took at Meta. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've, I've looked around quite hard in, in the cloud environments for um, v6 deployment, particularly of the container-based solutions. I'll come on to the containers in a second. Um, it's very important in that environment um, because otherwise you, you, you can't, you can't uh, get any reliance for the developers who are coming across a new thing or the architects. They're going to be confident it's going to work or how, how, or how it's going to fail and therefore how they need to manage it. Those things are, are really crucial to get right up front. Um, let's say the container development model is becoming the, the, the preferred development model. It's not super clear to me who's using what. Kubernetes is, is widely used, although it is quite a big learning curve. Um, there's, a, there's an evolution of things like K3S, which is a small thing. So specialist cloud providers like Sivo uh, deliver a, uh, a Kubernetes environment. They manage Kubernetes, but they use K3S, not K8S. Um, and as I say, things like Docker Swarm, which is an easy, easy to deploy model, just doesn't work with IPv6, unfortunately, uh, which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, I mentioned before that there was a realization, partly due to the work that we, we did in, in Tideway uh, and BMC, identifying what IT, there was, IT was in use to move to clouds. Unfortunately, um, some organizations didn't take the, the correct route and use the deployment model I showed. They did a lift and shift. Um, but at least, at least they started to do it. Um, that, that means you've got to sort out within the, within the um, container world your uh, load balancing and your firewalls. And unfortunately, uh, developers are very familiar with NAT. They think it's a firewall environment, even if it isn't. Um, and they don't want to move away because it's so far away in their career from having to do anything else. So you get kind of a group think about IPv4 is good enough. Because yeah, I know I can get to everybody with IPv4 at the moment, so why, why, would, I, why would I stop? Um, and from an investment point of view, why would I start investing in skills that I don't need immediately? I, I, I did, part, as part of this exercise, I went out to see some uh, marketeers um, to, to see how they, they look at this. Because one of the changes in the way applications are delivered is they're now, the user base isn't the internal people. So if the application is hard to use, you can't just beat them up and say you must use it. They tend to sit in suppliers and customers. So it is important that things are responsive and they, they're easy to understand and what have you. Marketers are aware of this, uh, but they don't tie that to it with IPv6. So there's a potential route there. So um, you know, I, I tried discussing IPv6 and IPv6 enabled the CDNs with people buying media and they just switched off, not, not in their space. 
Um, I think most of the languages support it quite well, um, but the problem is they're not, they're not well tested. So I did some work with um, Shiny, which is a JavaScript application uh, that runs on top of R for delivering web pages of interactive graphics um, for, for displays like the one that was in slide two. Um, and that didn't have or support IPv6 when you, when you go to the GitHub page. So I changed the library, put in IPv6, and it worked. And I told them, and they said, well, we don't care because we're definitely not interested in it. So it's not, it's not in their official test process, so it's not properly supported. So it will break at some point when the libraries change. Now, as, as the IT models evolve, um, the, 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 we, we've got a, the, I can see a number of changes in the architecture that are being enabled by IPv6 and are occurring at the same time, and there's a risk that v6 will be blamed for them. Um, a common scenario when you go to a consult for an organization is they've used a particular technology to build a system and it failed, usually because of the way they use the technology. But now the badness is associated with the name of the technology that was used. So nobody would dare touch it in the organization. Um, I can see this happening for v6 in, in, in these contexts. Um, there's a move to use containers and there's a move to use what are called microservices, which are small sets of applications focused on a part of the business unit, uh, business value chain, um, deployed as completely independent sets of, sets of functionality. Uh, so if you look on the right-hand side, the REST APIs indicate where those, those connection points are. To the right of those, there are clusters of containers that are delivering the service. And when you look at the way those are delivered, because in the cloud, a machine can disappear at a moment's notice, reliability has moved from being in the hardware to being in the software. And a lot of people actually haven't built it in yet, um, which is the win of things like Kubernetes because they do do that, but the learning curve's too big. Um, so you can have tens or hundreds of containers behind each one of those points. And the link from the left-hand side to the right-hand side has to both have the firewalls in place and the load balancing, which means that it's got to know how it's going to deliver to which, which particular instance, keeping track of what, what each instance is doing. And the way that that's done is typically by NAT. It's just the way they do it. Um, and I haven't seen any good practice for anything else. So nobody believes there's another way to do it. So they're just going to keep on the, on the practice, I think. Um, as IoT becomes more, more, more common, you're going to find that the right-hand side, which in this diagram is really in a data center, bits of it are going to move out onto the internet. So it becomes even more complicated. Uh, an aspect of the right-hand side that's not, not very obvious on there is there are actually connections between the orange and the red, say, uh, where, they, they, where you're having to update the product catalog with the, the current exchange rate. Um, I have tried, I said, using V6 in, a, um, in an IoT environment, and it, it, it looks like it does present some good interesting benefits. So matter was mentioned earlier. Now matter is not looking at remote controlling of cameras that move because it doesn't work very well. And that's the same as the situation I found. It was taking 30 seconds to set up a connection to a camera to control it, which isn't a useful use case. It doesn't work. Um, and it was costing 30% more for engineering time to build it. Um, so we didn't do it, we just, you know. Ne nevertheless, we did, so we did use IPv4 even though it's more expensive because we knew everybody had it. And the si part of the situation there is that your external dependencies include ISPs. And if some of your customers are using a non-V6 capable environment, you're going to go for the lowest common denominator until everybody's got IPv6. Yeah, that's not, not a great situation. So un until pe there are more IPv6 only states than there are th those that have V4 as well, that's going to continue to be an issue, I think. Um, I did try getting organizations as well to use an IPv6 first, first model. You know, let's not use NAT. Let's think about using a higher level load balancer. Um, that was just too hard to get the developers to think about it because it wasn't what they knew and it didn't work out of the box. So they didn't want to do it. Um, there are already, I have, I've seen a number of issues with CG NAT in the environment, particularly with IoT. Um, and that doesn't get the visibility it needs to in, in operational support, I don't think. Um, it's a real nightmare to get rid of. Um, I, but it's, for the most part, I don't think it appears in current applications because the typical model is I sit at a computer and I consume resources that are sitting in a data center. So it, it's, it's more of an issue when you've got an IoT device shoving stuff up to, to devices in the cloud. Um, 
I like, I like Veronica's comment about separating out the operational world um, so that you know where people are coming in from, because I think that's a real potential win for operations. And, and I'm hoping to talk to some suppliers about that sort of thing. Um, I think if it, the, there is an issue about getting suppliers and customers and developers to work out what the business value is for the organization and for themselves. Until you address both of those, it ain't, it ain't gonna move, I don't think. Um, So we, you know, we've already talked about better user experience. We know that's real, but people don't believe it or it's not important enough. Um, the development is simpler. Root calls and ask could be easier. These are all wins, um, but they're not bought by the businesses at the moment. Uh, we need to work out how to get a message across. It may be the best way is through the media um, or just constantly going out and banging a drum. Um, I personally think there needs to be some work on, particularly around the, uh, the load balancers and the firewalls for the cloud systems, to make those the first one that people come across to for the IPv6 solution. Demonstrations it works, examples of how it fails, therefore what controls you need to put in place, and success stories where it's worked so that people buy it and start to use it. Um, I won't talk about load balances because I, I, I don't think they're a well understood thing, but they are crucial in the context of container based systems. Um, because the units of, unit of computers move from being a computer to being a thousandth of a computer. So you've got an awful lot of them, and they're gathered in clusters that can be anywhere around the world. Um, okay. The, the, it was interesting you mentioned ACLs. I don't think ACLs work at scale, the same scale as, as, as V6. Um, when I was at university a long time ago, we were talking about um, capabilities, object capabilities, uh, which were overtaken by ACLs subsequently. Um, that is where you allocate during the process of designing an application what the use, use case is about, what the user therefore can be able to do, and you embed that in the application. So the security is part of the use case development rather than being something that's managed by a group in the organization that's separate. Because when it's a different organization, it takes too long and they get it wrong because they don't understand the applications well enough. Uh, and I have seen that as well. Um, okay. And I'm sure you can read the last one. Okay. That's me done. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Mm -hmm. There's one from Tom, I know that. <laughs> I'll let someone else go first. <laughs> Saving the best to last. Um, you made a good point there about um, IPv4. When you get more IPv6 than IPv4, that's going to be the tipping point. You've also touched on CGNAT. That's going to be the complex interacting point that's going to push the balance because um, CGNAT is causing a lot of problems. So I'm on one of these outlets that Tom yeah. mentioned in his yeah, talk yeah. earlier. Um, they are on their default provision CGNAT for IPv4 with native IPv6. Yeah. Fine throughout the day, mostly if you're on the CGNAT provision, you can pay more money to get global IPv4, and I do. But most of my students who are on the same network are on the CGNAT, and they find that their network quality on v4 is abysmal. You're talking dropped sessions, you're talking half-loaded pages, all of that. The, the, risk, the risk for you is that that is a, not a level playing field of the market. Exactly. It might be resisted by the big players. Well. There's more and more of these outlets are going CGNAT as more and more of the right. mobile phone providers. But it might, it might be that they're barri that's a barrier to entry, so the big players are going to enjoy that. True. But it does mean that it's not just a cut and dry yeah, no, yeah, when we no, get no, IPv6 true. only. It means that when you get lower quality yeah. IPv4, and we are heading that way. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that. I, I think the, the issue from, from the enterprise point of view is that it needs to be visible to the enterprise application developers, and, and they don't see that. I have seen that the, the, the instance I saw was with a large... UK telco uh, that doesn't have IPv6, uh, and I found one particular mast would occasionally get CGNAT problems, and you can see it, but it's, a, it's not the sort of thing you can get, you layer one or layer two people to try to solve from, from an application point of view. No, no. <laughs> it's fine. Good point, thank Oop. you. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, yeah, so I think you've just gotta be aware that it is quality, not just provision. No, no, uh, quality is the whole thing. I, 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 you're absolutely right. Good, good, good to pull that. Yeah. 
Any more queries? There's one more over here. Um, whilst we're getting over there, yeah. I was going to suggest that this felt like a very cynical view. So it's quite a sort of a, a, looking at the, the situation as it has been, not necessarily the situation as it could be or should be in mm. the future. And I, um, I was thinking quite a bit about what you said about Y2K. And mm. I, uh, Graham obviously mentioned this just now, but the, 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 the parallel to Y2K, the biggest one so far is the Unix epoch that, we've, that we know about, mm. the 2038 bug, where that goes to round to zero again and runs out. Are any of the folk that you've been out and spoken to worried about that yet? Some are, yes. That's good. That's very good. But I feel as if if we are in a situation where we are considered experts, consultants, and everything forth in the future, when we hit a roadblock and someone says, oh, I don't worry about that, do we stop at that point? No, and, and part of the selling process is, is to say, if you carry on down this route, this, this is the stuff that I, I want to get in, I think should be coming out in the documentation, saying that if you continue using NAT, and, and part of the issue is you've got to get rid of NAT entirely, I think, then, then or as much as possible, yeah, then you're going to lead yourself into these sort of problems, things mm. like CG NAT and what have you. Mm. And you're, what you're doing is you're building up uh, tech debt. Now, as the rest of the, the, as the internet expands, you're going to find that a lot of your legacy environments are going to cost you more to fix. But you need to, you need to get people who are senior enough and going to be around long enough to feel the pain of that happening in five years' time. Well, yeah. I mean, there's certainly a lesson to be learned from Meta and, and, and various other large companies that are very engineer-led, mm. where they haven't sort of almost bullied their development teams into meeting a deadline and saying, well, do whatever you can, make it cheap. Of course, you know, Zuckerberg himself is a very capable engineer. Mm. He's, of course, gone far, far further in terms of, uh, you know, and understands engineering more than most CEOs ever yeah. could. That shows very, very quickly. We have tons of IPv6 coming out of you know, yeah. Facebook. So um, there, there, is a, there is a worthwhile point there. And I would say as well that it's very, very, very important to make sure that no one thinks of IPv6 deployments as an either or. You, you don't turn off v4 and turn on v6. We do need to run them yeah, no, concurrently. You raise a good point. I think one of the issues on that, though, is that um, as soon as you start deploying v6 and v4, your costs go up because you have to have the extra cost in support to make sure that you can track what's going on. So do you want to get over that bump? Now, if you've got a new, new product idea that you're going to test in the market, you may not want to make it very expensive and robust to start with until you demonstrate it's working. Once, once it's going, yes, you want to do that. Well, but you've got to get through the early, early business cases. The alternative is you kick the can down the road constantly. No, indeed. And, and unfortunately, that's what people are doing. Yeah. Hi. So I have two quick questions. One is uh, the whole Docker and IPv6 mm -hmm. situation. Uh, had the same problem. Have you found an alternative? Because Podman also doesn't work. Ranch or desktop from SUSE doesn't work. So yeah, is there any solution for that? The only solution I'm aware of is to not use Docker on the desktop, but to develop your code and then push it to a remote Docker that, that's doing it, right? And, and ideally within the cloud, which gets around some of those problems, it'll, it'll lengthen your development cycle a bit. But that, that's the, the, the same approach. Yeah, that's the way they deploy on a Linux machine. Can I make one administrative note? Uh, yeah. Just on that particular point. Okay. Sorry, I'll give it back to you. There are some conversations coming up in, in the later session yeah. around containers and IPv6. So we could actually end up having this discussion again. I, I, think, I think containers of v6 is, is a good solution. Mm. But what I think is that there's a, a barrier in terms of current understanding of the people who are using it. And a resistance on their part, typically, because they don't see any immediate benefits. The second question, again, like I think we all share the CG not slash not mindset hate here. But one thing is from the application developer's perspective, we often get short signed by the ISP. You know, like Internet of Things that you were mentioned. Uh, I'll deploy some, I don't know, uh, stateless, leaderless P2P protocol things and like with sensors and they should be independent. Mm. And then the ISP, ISP blocks all inbound IPv6 uh, traffic, including ICMPv6 and yeah. things like that. So one thing is the not mindset 
ends up like, okay, let's fire all over team to keep things cheap or secure. Sure, I mean, the, the, the issue at the moment there is, particularly the space I was looking at, which was consumer IoT. Um, because you can't guarantee that you've got V6 everywhere, you have to cope with V4 anyway. So you have to get your devices to call up and you're running Stun or ISO, you're running some node in the cloud that you talk to that you then, and it sustains a link to it, you talk to it, talk to the devices that way. And then you're running a kind of a shadow network, uh, which isn't a great model, it'd be much better if you could do it in V6, but that's the only pragmatic way because otherwise you find you've got a bunch of customers that are using something that you then can't get to. Now, if your marketing budget says, I'm happy to avoid that, that market segment, that's, that's fine, but typically no, especially when you start it because you want to grab everything you possibly can. Yeah, that's fair enough. The thing is, you can't, uh, even as a large business, you can't really, uh, I, I couldn't negotiate a contract where I could use IPv6 as it meant to be like, I have control of the firewall, the ISP is just no, yes. block it at the trunk. That's, that's, yeah, that's the, the, the main complaint at the moment. You know? no. Any more questions for Tim? One at the front. Thank you. Are we running out of time? Sure, sure. Okay. So, uh, just one point in regards to bootstrapping or um, starting new prototypes. What we saw in Switzerland is that it was actually very, very successful at hackathons to give people just their own slash 64, even their own slash 48, and get them started with the applications. So while you're absolutely right, like when you go production, you still have the needs for IPv4 connectivity at the moment. But for it actually getting developers up and including Docker and co. I'm, I'm not going too much into this right now. But you can get, actually get people, developers, with IPv6 and tell them, hey, you are worldwide, globally reachable. Just put your application on your notebook go ahead. Yeah. So this is a very cost-effective solution yeah. if you're not yet in the production mode. Just uh, that's a really good idea. If you can find a route to those developers, absolutely. I think that's a really yeah. good idea. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I would just say um, to everybody that with Tim and a few other people, uh, based on the discussion that happened at the annual meeting in uh, November, we're basically working slowly on the way how we could actually encourage the developer community to change this mindset, as to get, uh, let go of not it's very hard, and I think, as Nico said, these outreach events, hackathons, um, what was happening in Amsterdam last week where they talked about the um, IP for scarcity as a main driver for IPv6 deployment in Kubernetes, etc. Honestly, I think even though the picture might not be as rosy, uh, it's a reality, and uh, let's take it as an opportunity for having these discussion debates you know, and changing it. You know? So thank you very much, Tim. Appreciate it. Okay, thank thanks. you.